just gonna say, you you ask you ask why we do this. stuck to the desk here. I haven't even checked out the bathroom yet, so you might want to just surprise us all. In 2007, a band you've never heard of went on tour to play a genre of music that you've never heard of with another band that you've never heard of either. There are many reasons why you wouldn't have heard of either of our bands, but the most interesting one is the genre of music we decided to play. Basically, it could best be described as a bunch of guys screaming over really complicated rhythmic patterns with distorted guitars. It was during this tour that I decided to ask my band and the other bands we play with why we bother playing a genre of music that virtually no one wants to listen to. Why do we take all our vacation time from our jobs to play in front of nobody and sleep in a van or a shady motel? My name is Mike, and I sing for a band called Carbomb. The band we are touring with in 2007 are called Last Chance to Read. After sleeping all night in our van, I asked my bass player Johnny to give me some insight into his state of mind. I learned nothing from our conversation. How did you sleep? Uh, broken, but I got better sleep than anybody else. Broken? Broken sleep. Yeah. A little here, a little there. Am I going... Did you have any weird dreams? Not that I remember. Kept waking up and going back to bed and waking up and going back to bed. And then that, that, did that fill you with sadness inside? No. Just tiredness inside. <laughs> Every show that we play makes me feel like a bigger and bigger failure. The reality of being in a metal band feels like an overwhelming weight crushing my hopes and dreams. Why am I inflicting these wounds on my ego? Bob from Last Chance to Reason seems to have a better understanding of why we are here, playing outside, for no one, next to a softball game. Why are you here right now? Like, why are you here? In Crestview, Florida, this lovely uh, surroundings of awesomeness. Uh, we're playing a show tonight. It uh, got thrown together like probably five days ago, six days ago. We had a day off, and I was like, "Well, fuck that, you know? Let's try to get some shit." And uh, so I got a hold of this kid via MySpace, and uh, he was said, "Yeah, you know, we'll throw it together, see what happens." And uh, he said, I got this pretty awesome outside venue, you know, we'll throw down. Crest View kids are pretty cool. So we said, okay, whatever. No, you know, a show is better than no show. Yeah, this is where we are. And it doesn't, in your opinion, does it have as much of a draw, say, as um, fucking hockey, whatever other types of music? Oh, absolutely hockey. not. We played fucking, where did we play? Beaumont, Texas, the other night. There was literally 10 kids there, 15 maybe, five of them sitting at the bar, and that was one of the best shows we've had all fucking tour, you know, it was like, the, you could feel it from the kids in the air, like it's either, you know, you just see that they're stoked, they're into the music, they're fucking loving it, they know what you're doing, and they're just, they're digging it, and um, that just makes you feel good, that's something that you've written, whether it be vocals or music or anything and that they like it and that you're reaching out to them and they're fucking stoked on it that just makes all the difference that's true and as we prepare the next day to play another show outside in a gazebo I try to keep a positive attitude as we drive to the next show I'm feeling pretty good however there are storm clouds rolling in and they seem to foreshadow another disaster I must lack the gene in my DNA that would allow me to be a positive person. 
because when we arrive, I am ready to kill myself. On top of that, there is an opening act who is playing his music through an iPod strapped to a statue of a dog. There is no way for me to put into words how incredibly stupid this makes me feel. Ah, uh, best thing I've heard since uh, sliced bread. S- sliced bread, <laughs> exactly. Does it make you want to commit suicide or anything like that? Uh, <laughs> can I can I say something? Yeah, of course. Okay, I'm gonna be completely honest with you. Uh, my first band. Oh my, that's good enough. They're called Downfall, right? Not to name drop or nothing, you know. <laughs> Played a couple tours, whatever. No, but seriously though, like my first band when I was like 13. Is like Metallica compared to this. <laughs> like Metallica with the orchestra all the time. <laughs> if they did the orchestra when Master of Puppets came out, yeah. which in an alternate reality, that's downfall compared to this. Like, I mean, this this is cool. Like, it's it's artsy. Not really. Am I doing this because I'm an artist? I'm not really sure. As the tour wore on, and we got closer to home, we stopped in Spartanburg, South Carolina, to play in front of about 10 people. You want to look at these people that actually showed up and say, look, it's not worth us unloading all our equipment, setting up, and playing for you guys. Let's all just get fucked up and forget about the show. You don't say that, though. Instead, you unload, you set up, and you play. Maybe you drink a little more than usual, so the voice inside your head stops saying, Why are you doing this? You play hoping that one day, you might play in front of 500, or maybe even 5,000 people, if you just play enough of these shows. Any ego you have, any pride you stored up, gets eaten away when you are done setting up, and there are still five people scattered around a club waiting to hear you. But it is at these shows where you develop the deepest bonds with the people who play them with you and the people who actually care enough to come out and watch. Here's a sample of what those people came to hear and see.
After watching us play, it's obvious that we use a lot of lights to distract the crowd and ourselves from the overbearing emptiness in the venues we play. My guitarist, Greg, spent a lot of time and money setting up, programming, and perfecting our light show. I had to ask him how and why. We had like half the setup and like, you know, tiny little wedges, so we were pretty much in the dark all the time. That took like three months just to get it off the ground. And we were playing like, you know, outside in front of like 20 kids that didn't want to see us play. And, uh, but then from there, we had like the basis of how it would work. And then, you know, once you, once you figure out the system of how to connect things, you just, you know, add new things on top of it. And, uh, you know, with each new tour, I try to do like, you know, a couple of weeks to a month trying to, you know, add new stuff or new programs or, you know, when new, we do new songs, we got to make new programs for those songs too. That summer was my first full tour with this band. When I came back to work, I realized that I felt different. I felt a freedom that I knew I would forget after a few weeks of staring at a computer screen eight hours a day. I began to wonder what people at my work thought of my hobby. I knew that none of them appreciated the music I played, but I was a little curious of what they thought beyond that. I asked my friend Jim for my work to give me his honest perspective. If you played a different type of music, and even you, like some of the guys in your band, if you guys played different music, you would probably be more successful, you know, whatever you want to say that is, as far as shows and CDs and stuff like that. I think by playing what you do play, definitely has held you back to, you know, band success, big time, and I don't get that, but it's good that you're true to your stuff, which is the most important thing, so, you know, that that's what should matter here, but, um... If I was in a band, I would say, guys, listen, let's play what we love, but, you know, where are we going with this? You know, where's our future? Where, you know, where, where can we get an audience to, like, you know, relay our message and stuff? Um, I think if you guys, you know, were, say, a level of not as intense, you'd be, like, you know, real popular and people would be like, oh, I love that. But for being so, like, in your own little thing, and, you know, even the other bands like you guys, you just... It's like you're off in your own little world. You guys play maybe to smaller crowds and you maybe don't sell as many CDs because but then your song is like, you know, I don't give a shit. This might suck, you know, if this tour doesn't go so well, but we like it and that's what we're doing anyway. And someone on the outside would be like, well, why would you do that then, man? Like, what are you doing? It's like you're in an uphill battle. And and we even when you say you made it to the top... There's five people. Exactly. Like, you know what I'm you saying? Got all five. Right, right. You got to the top, and then, you know, what, what's up there? Uh, so, you know, only the, your personal satisfaction. That's really, uh, I guess to summarize your guys' band journey, it's just your, your guys' personal happiness, you know, if you can get that even, and uh, which would be something most people don't get out of life. After the tour, I realized that I have been sitting on the fence between working and doing what I really want to do with my life. I imagine that most people would quit something that is so futile, expensive, and depressing, but not us. The next year, we got an offer to do another tour, a longer, more expensive tour with two bands that sounded nothing like us, Bella Morte and Gorgeous Frankenstein. We thought this would be a good thing because both bands spoke a more common language, 
which meant that we could expect more people showing up to hear us play. Of course, our optimism was crushed after the first few shows. This tour opened my eyes to how hard it is for any band, no matter which genre of music they play, to make a living playing music full time. Bella Morte is a talented rock, punk, goth metal band that definitely has a shot at appealing to a large audience. They are speaking a more common language that many people can understand if they take the time to listen. Yes. It's just like one of those things that you could take that money and then make whatever music you wanted to and and be hugely successful with it because all of a sudden I've got a couple of million dollars and I'll be like, hey, hey, Bella Morte, let's, let's put a million into promoting this next album. So it'd be a dumb gig to pass up, but at the same time, would I feel like a douchebag? Absolutely. Well, it's kind of one of those things that I, I've, I've had to deal with over the years um, where there's like... As an artist, you have to make art, but in order to not starve, you have to make money. And a lot of times, those two things don't correlate with each other. In fact, like most of the time, like you have to make the art that you want to make and just figure out some way to get by, whether it's being poor or getting another job or whatever. So, you know, if I could get a job, say, that paid me a million dollars to play keyboards and that would then fund me to do the art that I want to do, hell yeah, I would totally do that. Do you think it would destroy your credibility in some I don't care. I, I'm not here to impress anybody. Whoever is going to tell me I sold out, didn't sell it, fuck them. Like, you know, I'm taking care of myself. To me, selling out is catering to those people. Catering to anybody except your own interests, your own artistic vision. To me, that's selling out. People have this, this idea that if you get popular, you sold out, but that's the dumbest shit in the world because it's it's kind of like saying like, say all of a sudden you went from having a hundred kids a night at your shows to ten thousand. I guess for some people to not sell out, what you would have to do is cap your door at a hundred people, like say, oh, I'm sorry, the other nine thousand nine hundred you can't come in, and and also the hundred that do come in have to be wearing black and a bullet belt. Like it's, it's fucking stupid. It becomes a fashion show at that point, and it's like. You do what you want, and if people like what you're doing, that's awesome. And and all the all the damn best of luck to every band. And I, every band wants to get there, whether they say it or not. Is you know, they're, I'm sure there are exceptions to the rule, but it's fucking fun to play for a whole lot of people. I have put uh, my I've put a ton of my own personal money into funding a band that really doesn't necessarily have the return. Um, anywhere even close to the amount that I put into it. Time and effort and money and whatever. If you're looking for a smart business venture, being in a band is not the way to go. What happens, at least that I know, is that there's a lot of band people and they get some kind of success to it. You know? Yeah. And then they realize, fuck, we're missing out on a big bit. They change their sound to start sounding more commercial. And then they just lose it all. I know. It, it That doesn't generally work. I mean, it, it has. You take Metallica. It, you... Love or hate the Black Album, those dudes made bank off that album. But me, I like everything before it a lot better. But um, but those guys probably like that album better than anything they've done because all of a sudden their wallets were that much thicker, you know? It's like, and it doesn't take away from what they did before, you know? It's like that music's still there, you pop the album and it doesn't sound different, you know? And, and who are they doing it for? Are they doing it to make sure their integrity is okay in the eyes of these fans. Hell no, they're doing it for them, and otherwise they've sold out. So it's like almost like if they don't sell out, they sold out. You know, so it's a kind of a it's a conundrum. Like the conundrum for us is that with each show, we wind up losing money while not gaining any fans. It would be worth losing the money if we were gaining fans, but the empty stares we get from the crowd tells us that that just isn't the case. I hear the hair buzzer humming away in the bathroom of our hotel, and I decide to ask Johnny what his current state of mind is. <laughs> it's a good look. It's a good look. I'm not covering it up, man. I'm just checking it out. It does feel nice. Yeah. It feels nice, especially because it's so short, and then you get a little long, and it's like, oh. <laughs> it's, gonna be it's a good look. You getting it all? How do you think it will go over with the... Oh, it's going to be a huge hit, man. It's, at least it's something. I mean, we got nothing. <laughs> it's been a good tour. It's been a fucking awesome tour, bro. It's been well worth it. Oh yeah, man. I mean, the money is just fucking incredible. The fucking chicks every night. It's like I don't even know. Like, have you ever had to like kick chicks out before? I mean, this is like a whole fucking new thing. 
Wow. It's fucking crazy. So it's totally worth it. Oh, yeah, man. Gas is, like, really cheap, so we're fucking hardly spending any money. And uh, the food's been excellent. Uh, yeah, everyone's fucking great. This is, like, I'm so glad we did this. This is why you got... This is why I got base. into... This is why I got into playing metal, man. I mean, for this tour right here. So when you were young, this is what you envisioned? Yeah, I used to see, like, Def Leppard videos and Motley Crue videos, and I was like, man, wouldn't it be amazing if someday that was us? And this is, is that day. It's, like, 20 years later, but today is that day. <laughs> awesome. And so this haircut is kind of going to... Gonna just accelerate that. Oh yeah, dream. it's like a new beginning, almost like a fresh start. Not that I need one because things are so great, but you know, <laughs> it's like the next level. What is the next level? All the members of my band, including myself, have full-time jobs. How would it be possible to get to the next level without giving up the security of a steady income? In a way, we have already sold out. When I first started playing music, I really believed that I would never do anything else. I interviewed a band that opened for us outside of St. Louis called Undead Spencers to remind myself how I used to think. This is the part where you applaud us for being awesome. More, be my ego. Damn right, glad you mentioned that. I'm Dr. Fletch, how's it going? Undead Spetsnaz. It's the, uh, you know when guys say, oh, that band made it or this band made it, what does that mean to you guys? Recognition. I like that they left something that'll be remembered in the future. Is that a certain amount of record sales or is that a certain amount of money? No, just the impact like, you make on society. Yeah, the, imp- like, the influence really you leave The behind. Stooges, for example. The Stooges have made a lasting impression on music yeah. 40 years ago, you know. Their record sales were so bad, that's why they broke up. They couldn't afford to be the Stooges anymore. But they have so much recognition and so much uh, influence just because they're the Stooges. I just want to have fun, and if we can leave some kind of mark on the music scene, that would be I awesome. could be as poor as shit for the rest of my life, as, as long as people know, hey, you were in Undead Spetsnaz, that legendary punk band, I'd be fucking <laughs> yeah, happy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we have to leave in like an hour? An hour or two. Muffins? Yeah, we'll get some muffins. You want some muffins and some coffee? I gotta go do laundry. Better get moving on that. <laughs> See the arches, monkey? It's the gateway to the west, guys. Two layers of protection. <laughs> <laughs> With each show, we go further and further into debt. In the summer of 2008, gas is at an all-time high. Halfway through the tour, we get the added bonus of having our trailer break on some railroad tracks at 3 in the morning. On the side of the road somewhere in the middle of the country, I probe John a little more to see how he's taking our recent run of bad luck. You got troubles? You got troubles? We do. Should I tell him how my wife left me? Oh yeah, that too. 
those kinds of troubles. No way, man. This tour is awesome, man. Didn't you see me the other night shaving my head? Just fucking the ball. <laughs> that was before the trailer, bro. No way, man. That just makes it better. It's a great story to add, man. All these documentaries you've seen, bro, there's always been tragedy. And they uprise above it. Yes. It's been worth it. No, not at all. Deeper and deeper in the hole we go. Deeper down the well. It seems so many people have such a better grasp on what it takes to be in a band and tour. Outside of one of our shows, I found Julian, who used to play and tour in a band called Black Lung. Julian is the embodiment of why I have a full-time job. He is the living manifestation of the fear that kept me from dedicating myself to a band full-time. Life's not all that, dude. Like, if you miss out on something that, like, you really enjoy, that's your passion. If you give up that chance to stay somewhere where you're not happy and you don't take that chance with life, then you miss an opportunity that other people won't get to see, like, you know, with the moments when you're on road and... You know, you come to a stop and you're taking a break to fill up with gas. I guess in this day and age, like, I guess it would be hard, dude, with, like, you know, the gas money, dude, like, nowadays. Like, when we did it, uh, like, we had to make the money at the gigs. Like, each gig that we played, like, we'd use the money for, like, each next town or whatever, whatever the trip was. Like, when we went on tour, like, we didn't get paid any money or anything like that, even though we forked out most of the dough for the tour. Like, I did it because it was, like, a chance for the people to see something that was rare, dude, like, in punk rock music, dude. And, like, like, the energy was, like, so rare, dude, that, like, when we would come across crowds, dude, like, the energy was so strong that, like, I was puking, like, all over the crowds. And, like, I was breaking bottles on people. Like, I was, you know, before each night before the show was over, I was giving my heart to it so bad that... Each town I played, I was leaving blood every show. Julian is someone who I could be if I didn't overthink every decision I have ever made in my life. I could be him if I decided to listen to my heart instead of my brain. As we continued our way back across the country, the shows got progressively worse until we finally got ripped off by two promoters in Chicago. So John, let's uh, ask you about last night. All right. Uh, we didn't get paid. Uh, the, name the, the name of the place was Mobs Up, and uh, both the promoter, Christy, and the uh, club owner, Steve, uh, totally fucking bailed. And, uh, you know, the guy, Steve, was like, just give us a little time so we can get the money, you know, try to make it up in the bar and get you guys some money. And shook my hand, and then uh, he fucking disappeared. And, tur and, and, turned the, and turned the cell phone off, so, I mean, it... There was a very nice bartender there. I don't know what the fuck her name was, man. But she was she was on the phone trying to get him. She called his wife. She called, like, his business partner. She was actually really, really helpful. I mean, nothing really amounted. But at least she fucking tried. So I'm pissed. Elliot's fucking pissed. I think uh, when Greg finds out, he's going to be pissed. Uh, I don't think you're too happy about it either, man. I want to fucking put a knife in that motherfucker's heart. First in his ball sack and then in his fucking heart. Like the same knife. Like this is the knife that was in your balls. I'd fucking slice open the, the scrot and just let him fall out. And maybe I'd like like bounce on him a little and then fucking take the knife and and then right into the fucking heart. I would fucking, I would slice off like fucking porterhouse steaks, like one at a time, and I cook them up until she came up with the 200 bucks. Nah, you don't have the money? And then. No, I don't want anyone to steal. I'm not a thief. I just want to piss on her crap on her chest and like go through her fucking wallet and take $200. Even though I'm not a thief. I feel like it's our money. Yeah, we can go fucking shopping. That'd be great. Hit them all. Get some more Jesus t-shirts. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Later that morning, ourselves and Bella Morte returned to the club that we played the night before to see if we can get the money that was promised us. 
Fortunately, none of us got our legs broken. Say, you look at my hat, you realize I'm very American. American. What these people are doing to us is very un-American. What are they doing? Oh, well, we all played last night. We had this, you know, show. Well, I won't say good show. I'll just say show. The promoters, they just, they left without paying us. And now we're back at the club the next day when we're supposed to be on the road to another, what I'm sure to be, ass-filled show. That will hopefully get paid for. We'll see. We'll see. You never know. It's a gamble is what it is. And as someone's supposed to be showing up that I'm assuming is going to be the Greek Mafia to break our legs and tell us to fuck off. It's the car bomb and Bella Morte like going broke and losing. That's the funny thing is we're out here trying to make some money and stuff. We're going to go home and be homeless after this shit. Bogus, man. So oh, they're gonna, no one will ever see this this interview because you're going to have to pawn that camera after this. <laughs> it all sucks though. I really hope we get resolution. I just want to fuck this $100. Asking so much. That's that's like two hundred more than nothing according yeah. to this club, dude. That's that's it's quite a bit. This guy is the uh, it's quite a bit. The guy. Muscle I don't know. Kick our ass. Uh, yeah. Hope not. Looks like uh, uh, After talking with the representative from the Greek mafia, Johnny was able to get our guarantee. After receiving the money, we promptly left the premises. This representative assured us that he would take up the money owed him with the promoters Christy and Steve. After a few more shows to end our lackluster tour, we took a few months to recoup before we got together to assess the financial damage. So, uh, we're home from the tour. Yes. Let's uh, assess the damage. Yeah. So you want to know how that broke down? So we, uh, it looks like we made, we earned about 6400 throughout the course of the year. I mean, the tour was pretty much all we did. Maybe we played a couple of off dates and sold a couple of shirts here and there. But sixty-four hundred uh, was income. Uh, it cost us thirty-two hundred to make that sixty-two hundred. In other words, we had a, the expense of the T-shirts, the expense of the CDs, and then uh, if you go down here, this is the automobile expense, which is basically oil changes, gasoline, uh, tolls, all that stuff falls under automobile expense. And there, we spent almost four grand, just shy of four grand, on that. Uh, touring in the summer of 2008 was probably the worst time for a band to tour ever on top of a pretty bad tour to begin with but uh, if you recall gas was like what 450 I think we spent five dollars a gallon you know in some places yeah across the country and driving you know a 15 passenger van towing a 6x12 trailer uh, definitely was eating gas we were probably getting about eight miles to the gallon so okay gas and all that yeah it cost us about Four thousand bucks, um, and then the <laughs> just the rental of the the van was twenty six hundred bucks, just a little over. So if you look at it from you know you add it all up, a couple of the odds and ends here and there, uh, we lost about forty five hundred dollars in two thousand and eight, um, and that sucks. You know that hurts. That hurts my pocket pretty bad. <laughs> you know I'm a working man. You're a working man. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that most of this $4,500 loss came out of my pocket personally. Yeah. 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 So that, that really hurts. Um, <laughs> some people fly kites for a hobby. Yeah, that's fun. Uh, <laughs> it's cheaper. Oh, it is. Remote control planes. I, uh, my dentist does that. It's pretty expensive. It is. You could, break them. You could break them. You could break them. And uh, they can run up there in the thousands. Sure. He's a dentist, though. He's got the money. Yeah. Dentists make a lot of money. They do. But, um, yeah, that's... A lot more than us. I don't think he had a net loss of forty five hundred bucks. No, I mean I don't know. Do model planes could they run a net loss over a year forty five hundred dollars? I mean I understand people have drinking problems, gambling problems, like those kinds of things. But model airplane problems, maybe it's out there. So you equate being in a band to have like having a drinking or gambling problem? <laughs> kind of. It's like you can't quit it, even though you know it's not really doing you any good. Yeah. yeah at least it's a creative outlet, though, man. And yeah. I get to you know live in a band for a month. <laughs> A bunch of dudes. That's fun. Here we are again. After losing a bunch of money last year and the year before, we still want to tour.
By this time, it's pretty obvious to all of us that we're not doing this for money. This tour is different though because we got lucky enough to open for two very popular and very successful bands, The Chariot and Gorgira. Both of these bands play and tour full time, and they gave us a glimpse into how hard a band has to work just to make a living playing this music. I don't know really why I'm I'm playing metal. Um, I I don't I, I could not explain what um, the reason why I play this music, but it's just like I feel uh, I feel it in my whole body, and it's just I need to express it. I need to express something uh, that I don't explain. Finally, but it's just here in my body. And I need to get rid of it, and then and make something out of it, and um, and find my own way. Finally, uh, in life in general, if even if this uh, music style is not like mainstream, or that's not th something that you learn in school or from your parents or whatever, it's something really personal. Well, so why do I play this type of music? Um, I would have to say live show. Numero uno, numero tuno. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, the reason I like this genre, as it were, is uh, is the live show. Um, I was put on this planet to perform live shows, um, and that's what I love about it. Um, I, I've actually been in a, a band in in previous in a previous life where it was not heavy or anything like that, and just not that fun, man. I mean, you can make them fun, but it's not my cup of tea. Uh, so I love the live show, and I love the uh, the camaraderie of a punk rock gig. You know, you got you got the, the it's not us on stage and them off stage, and 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 we're playing to them. It's it's everyone in a in a bowl stirred up and mixed together, um, and it's just. Uh, it's just the real meaning of the word punk rock, you know. I mean, it's it's a true, true sense of it, of it all. So uh, that's what I love. Um, yes, I'll never make a dime doing it, but uh, I'd rather die a starving artist and love what I'm doing than to um, to have a lot of money and hate my life. It's tough, and it's tough being in, uh, I guess you could say, quote unquote, unex inaccessible genre. Yeah and try to make enough to, you know, make sure your stomach is even full yeah. on a regular basis. I think a lot of people in this genre have a tendency to work harder just because they, I mean, it's not a monetary, it's not a monetary payout at the end of the day. It's, yeah, I don't know, it, it fills your entire being more so, you know, it's a, they just, they love what they're doing as opposed to it's a job. I would feel dead. Uh, if I would give up the essence and the honesty that comes from the music and I, I would feel like dead you know I, I'd rather die instead of doing that who's to say that I haven't sold it already I mean the second I left the garage or the basement I kinda sold out the second I put anything on a CD and tried to sell it to kids it's almost an act of desperation it's just like I can finally just have a little bit of a break and just like I don't know, like, you know, be able to do this and I don't get married or like 
you know, some maybe put a down payment on a house and have somewhat of a normal life instead of sleeping in there. There is too much sacrifice uh, to live this life and to make a living out of it. It's really hard and it, it, it took me 10 years. I would like more comfort in my life. I would like to have a house and uh, be able to raise a family and uh, get have money on my account. Uh, which is not the case right now. I just have a little bit and it's not enough to buy a house or even uh, uh, Have a rent, you know, uh, I don't know. It's it's hard. You know the life is hard but uh, It is so precious to be able to uh, To to play the music that comes from the guts, you know, it's it's so precious. It means something I I, I gave up uh, a lot of things to uh, a, sac a lot of sacrifice for this music, so um, it's too important to to give up. At the end of the day, if you can actually make ends meet doing this, it, yeah, I think it'd be far more gratifying than you know making sure your your choruses are nice and catchy, you know, yeah. and you have some weenie singing over top of it, you know. <laughs> I don't know. Music is is nothing. It's just like uh, vibrations, you know, sounds, whatever you call it. Uh, but at the same time, it's so powerful, and it means so much to everybody. Like uh, uh, everybody is, um, everybody can can uh, understand music, and, uh, but without being uh, able to explain it. So it it talks to people. This tour was the first time I felt like I was playing in a professional band. After our tour, Grazier went on to open for Metallica and Lamb of God. Joe from Grazier got me an interview with Randy from Lamb of God. Lamb of God is one of the most successful tech metal bands around today. This inspired me to interview a few other successful tech metal bands to get a fuller understanding of what that life is actually like. After watching Gorgira open for Metallica in front of thousands of people in Montreal, I met Joe backstage to congratulate him and find out what it's like to play on such an amazing tour. Like tonight, for example, for me was was bad. Really like a nightmare, you know, I was struggling all the time because I couldn't hear uh, my guitar enough. I couldn't, I didn't have, uh, I don't know, I, I didn't feel it really, you know. But it, it happens like once in a while, every 10 gigs, right? for sure, and sometimes four or five gigs in a row, and that, uh, it becomes really hard. In the band, uh, we're pretty much the same, we're uh, perfectionists, you know, how do you pronounce that shit? Perfectionists. Yeah. Perfectionists. Exactly. And um, so when something goes wrong, or if the guitar is out of tune, it, it becomes impossible, you know. I, I wish I could stop playing and then tell people, I'm so sorry, we're going to start over. And stuff. But we, we never do that, of course, because the show must go on and you have to 
but uh, it's very, very challenging. But you know that. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, it's, for my band, it's their perfectionists. I'm just a fucking retard. Anyway, but I understand. Good, good. That's, that, that's, I, I wish I could be like a retarded like that. <laughs> <laughs> it, it does take a special kind of person to get to that certain level of musicianship. And, it, and especially because a lot of those type of musicians kind of stay underground but you know they are very well respected by other musicians and by a certain amount of people and uh which is cool there's a, all my favorite whenever i list my favorite drummers to people most people haven't heard of them but these are guys that i think are amazing that uh it doesn't matter if they're popular or not you know to me it's just like these guys have spent so much time perfecting their craft and I really admire it. Some drummers aren't happy just going, <laughs> you know, they want to go, you know, go to, yeah. just to see how crazy they can go and uh, see how far they can take it just to kind of challenge yourself. <laughs> There is a very serious work ethic in what in what we do, man. We work very hard, like what God does. There's a band that I happen to respect. Um, they're from France. They're called Gojira, and they have really built themselves. They've built their own rehearsal studio. They built their own like basically distribution business before anyone gave a fuck about them. They handle a lot of their own business, and they control their own business. So I have a lot of respect for that. And it is work. Anybody that uh, gets into music for the idea of making some sort of living out of it is deluding themselves very seriously. Um, you know, there's so many good bands out there that try and try and try and never make it anywhere. Um, I think there's a few key things that will determine if you make it. Uh, whatever your idea of success is as a band. I think A, you have to be able to suffer for a long, long time. I've been doing this band for 15 years. Uh, and only in the last 11 have I been able to make a living off of it. Initially, money was never important to me. You know, not at all. Because A, that was 15 years ago, I was a lot younger. Uh, and I didn't mind living like shit and sleeping on people's floors forever. Now money is in the equation because I'm 38 years old. I would like to have children. You know, I can't do that making $50 a night for a show. But I mean, if you if you're if you want to be a musician for money, you're in it for the wrong reason. You know, it's all about this. Jobs, like regular nine to five jobs, they pay you to be forgotten, to do what you're supposed to do, and then forget about you. But when you do a band. Like, you kind of remembered. Like, who knows? I mean, you've influenced thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of people. Yeah. So, you, I mean, it's way more important than a yeah. nine to five job and making money. Yeah. Because, <laughs> but seriously, right? Like, I mean, that's a, a big thing is not just to do money isn't so important. It's a matter of the, what, the legacy you leave behind. And, yeah, sure. You know, working in some nine to five job, what legacy you leave behind. Nobody gives a shit. They're like, I paid you, now get the fuck out. But when you're yeah. in a band, and you influence so many people. I mean, bands, people remember you for years and years and years. Yeah, the, the, the thing is, um, it's really, really cool what you're saying right now, and it's, it's, uh, it makes me happy. You know? right. But uh, it's hard for us to have a normal life, to have a family, you know, so glory is, is cool. But it's, why, you know, who needs glory and why, you know, just to fulfill 
a certain need that we have somehow of uh, not be forgotten and, and leave um, a footprint, you know, on, on, on the ground for decades or maybe several generations. But it's, it's good, you know, uh, for the music or for the fans. And, but for us, it can be a struggle too, you know. It's a, it's a real sacrifice. Like exactly, it, it is a sacrifice. Probably vagina, that's the biggest thing I sacrifice. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, when you play drums in a metal band and you live in a warehouse and you're not making any money, the options for getting laid really aren't there. So I definitely <laughs> sacrificed that. I didn't get laid for like 10 years while I was playing in bands. And it was like, you know, that was kind of, as weird as it sounds, it wasn't high on my priority list because I wanted to just be an amazing drummer, amazing musician, and uh, just do concentrate on music, and and I did that, and uh, I definitely sacrificed having any kind of you know relationships and things like that. But it was fine. I, I was young, you know, from the years of like 19 till I was 29. That's all I did was pract I'd practice drums two to four hours a day work my electrician's day job, um, practice with the band two or three hours at night, and it was the same schedule six days a week. Sunday was really the only day I had to relax, but it was worth it. It was just, I was young and I wanted to, you know, be a drummer and travel the world, and I got to do that, so it was worth it. Every now and then I have these weird, because in our society you're told, you know, you have to get an education, you have to, you have to work, you know, and get fit into the little box that society tells you you have to do in order to be a successful person. That has never been an option for me, you know, because I'm a fucking freak. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't work in a cubicle. It just wouldn't work. I'd kill myself. For sure. Yeah. In the future, I may go back to school, get a business degree in accounting, in accounting, or you know, econ or something like that. Yeah, I'll do your taxes. Have a family, support them. But right now, I love doing this punk rock stuff. For as long as it rides me, for sure. For as long as it rides me, for sure. I don't need anything elaborate. Some people need out of control stuff. And I just don't, I just got to a point where I was like, I don't really need that. So. I, I know what I need to use money for and how to, how to make it work to make the band flow. And then from there, you know, like outside of it, you know, when I'm working at home and I'm working a job and I put money away here and there. You learn too that you go out on the road, sometimes you come home with nothing. So work a bunch before you go and build up a whole bunch of money. So when you go out and you lose it, you have a backup, you know, like a nest egg in a sense. That's a lot of things, man, because when you tell people how much you get paid too, some of it's like... I mean, really, it's kind of f fucking ridiculous, you know. You'll be out on a tour and you're getting 250 a night, you know. It's and there's four to five guys in a band. People are just like 250 dollars a night. Most of that goes in the goddamn gas tank, you know. And they're like, "Are y'all fucking crazy?" It's, it's a genre where you're not going to get laid, but you have to practice the hardest. Yeah, and to you're be not going to get money either. Like you're not mm -hmm. going to sell a ton of records, most likely. Yeah, and you're gonna, you know, going to get paid 200 dollars a show. So when you like, look at it that way, it is pretty crazy <laughs> to think why would anybody do that, but. <laughs> You know what, that's why it's a special thing and not many people can do it because it's, the payoff is your love of that type of extreme music and, uh, you know, and to be respected by other musicians and to, to have fans that dig that and, uh, you know, not everything can get you laid and make you tons of money, but that doesn't mean it's not worth doing, you know. You just kind of got to do what you feel. If you start thinking about wanting to impress certain people, then it kind of gets in the way. You can't please everybody. You just have to do what you like. And uh, if it doesn't sell a million albums, and you know, a lot of bands are lucky to even be out there in a van on tour. I mean, a lot of people, bands don't even get to do that. So it's like, well, if you at least get to do the music you love and, and you get to make a little bit of money off of it, that's better than you know trying to write something that you don't feel good about to make tons of money. Because a lot of times... You know, if you had fans that were there the whole time and you start changing things a little too much, they get a little weird about it. You have the original 
solid people that feel kind of betrayed almost you know it's from what I've experienced they feel like wait what this isn't the the, the band that I fell in love with and, and I've been supporting you since you were nobody and then all of a sudden when they if if they do make new people that like them there's no there's no uh, there's no roots settling in you know there's no uh, there's no like groundwork that, that that keeps it there as soon as you make a an album that they're not too into it's like eh, it's done with you, you know I, I really enjoy playing smaller places and I enjoy bigger places I enjoy places with no barricade where people can be up to the front closer because it's it's more impactive and the people are there in your face and everybody the second there. best hair in death metal <laughs> <laughs> He's got so, <laughs> and uh, so, I mean, I because I, I played on really big stages and big things, and I played small stages, and I just I like the feeling of the smaller, tighter rooms, the little, the little rat holes per se, or things like that, and then it's packed with people, and it's just intense. I like the intensity of it, and the way everybody's having a good time, you know, and people are falling on you, things are fucking going crazy. You know that's it's it's awesome. You know, to some degree, as the bigger you get, you you start getting further and further from your the people. You you uh you have to start doing barricades. You have to start doing you know uh, 500 kids. You can individualize. You know you can see uh, facial expressions of 500 kids. Uh, 5,000 kids. You know you don't even see the front row really because it's just a sea of people. You know. Um, and yes, that would be a nice cushion in the pocket, but you wouldn't have that camaraderie. And uh, and although the music may be punk rock and maybe uh, maybe something that you can relate to, you lose that whole the the mentality, the the reality of of a punk rock show, and it, it, it just waters down and gets washed away. But you sit on a big old fatty wallet. <laughs> but who cares about that? It's just money. <laughs> But to me, it shows that, you know, they're appreciating something that you've done and you work on. They're really getting into it. So it's almost like feeding off of each other. They're enjoying what you do and they're having a good time. And then you're excited because everyone's having a good time. It's something you basically created. I mean, I'm not, I don't, for me, it's not like some kind of like Hitler thing where it's like, you, you, oh, I got all these people here and they're listening to anything I say and I can say anything right now and they'll do it. It's absolutely incredible to make 50,000 people beat the shit out of each other. It's <laughs> absolutely incredible. You know, it's an amazing feeling. Uh, but you have to remember, I mean, for me, I mean, it's fairly a benign thing. I mean, you're speaking of Nietzsche. There was another dude who loved Nietzsche that was Hitler. You know what I mean? And he got lots of people to do lots of fucked up things. And yeah, I get people to do fucked up things too. <laughs> they enjoy it and it's a release. My wife, her mother, is uh, was born and raised in China. The first time she saw my band, we were opening up for Slipknot. And I... Uh, I'm like, all right, I want to see a circle pit. And there's about 7,000 people there. So there's a good thousand people on the dance floor doing a circle pit. And my mother-in-law is watching us for the first time, looks at my wife, Cindy, and she's like, why are they all running? Why are they running in a circle? And my wife goes, well, because Randy told them to. And she goes, why are they listening to him? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question, you know? <laughs> After interviewing all of these bands and seeing what it takes to be in this genre, I'm still not sure if I could detach myself from this 9-to-5 lifestyle. This year, my job is being outsourced to another company, and as I look at all the reports, computer code, and hard work I have done for this job, I realize that it is all going to be forgotten. At the same time, I look at the last CD Carbomb has put out and wonder about the thousands of people who have been influenced by our music. Even though it's a very small amount of people, I know that our music will not be forgotten. I guess for me, that is why I do this.
these things balanced on a, uh, a crabby jack and a rock. And we got our hand up under trying to tighten it. You know, so if it falls, we're dead. And these girls are just yelling. And I mean, just the worst people, you know. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah. And uh, no, they're, they're great, I'm sure. But anyway, they... <laughs> how big is this going to get? Uh, <laughs> they... The thing that made it for real, that made them the coolest people, because I was like frustrated. I mean, you're just nervous, you know, you're just trying to, come on, we gotta get, they're yelling and stuff and so whatever. They saw this, which is awesome. Alien, brain, yin yang, flames, tribal, truth is out there. <laughs> They saw that and was honestly talking back and forth with each other going, man, that that would make a great tattoo. And I was like, yes, it would. Like, please get that tattoo. Please. Like, begging, begging. Right the tramp stamp, man. Like, dude, right, right down dude. there. Oh, my gosh. That would have been great. So then they got on the idea of tattoos, and they were showing us, you know, they had the, the moon with the dolphin jumping through it. <laughs> And uh, every time they show, like, that's awesome, you know. So it was a good night. That that made everything like everything was okay.